Um, but thanks for you know taking time out for from your afternoon to, to share some time with us and talk air quality, environmental justice, and more. Um, my name is Adrian Wren. I'm a, a project leader here at Valley Vision. Valley Vision is a nonprofit that's located on Third Avenue in Oak Park. Um, and tonight we're going to be discussing the Sacramento Neighborhoods Activating on Air Quality or SNAC 2.0 project, which is an effort to support two of the Sacramento region's most polluted communities, uh, North Sacramento and Oak Park, in monitoring their air and then actually taking action to reduce pollution. And I'm joined by um, friends and colleagues with Civic Thread, formerly Walk Sacramento, as well as Breathe California and Green Tech Education. So to, to help us get to know one another, let's, let's introduce ourselves in the chat. You can share your name as well as either your organization or your neighborhood, uh, and we can see who's in the room. Uh, and then a little bit of background before we dive in. Um, so SNAC is part of a new California program called the Community Air Protection Program, or AB 617, which is intended to shift really decision-making power to community members in mitigating air pollution, and then backing those resident-led decisions with funding uh, and the state of California's regulatory authority. So with this program, we have a really unique opportunity to better understand our air quality and how to actually do something about it. And so I'm going to put in the chat a link to the project page where we've posted a lot of information. Um, so check that out, click through if you'd like, if you haven't already, um, there's, there's a lot there. Um, so real quick before we, before we kind of start the discussion, just some logistical stuff. Um, this is a Zoom meeting. So if you have questions you'd like to verbalize, just please use the raise hand function. Um, depending on your version of Zoom, it's either under the participants button or the reactions button. And then those of you using the Zoom app on iPhone or Android also have this option. Those calling in, I don't think we have any, um, should dial star nine to raise or lower your hand and then star six to unmute. And of course there's a chat box for comments. So really appreciate that. Um, I am going to paste the agenda in the chat so we can all take a look. So here's what we're looking at, hoping to, to talk about today. So we're, we're doing our welcomes now. Um, Want to provide a little bit of background about basically where we're at with this project. We've been working on this project for two years with many of you, and we have a lot of new faces as well. So want to recognize that and get folks caught up who haven't been involved. Um, so we'll be doing a kind of an overview of where we've been, uh, an overview of what's coming. So, so possibilities around SNAC 2.0. Uh, and then doing a deep dive, this conversation will be led by Civic Thread, our friends at Civic Thread, deep dive into participatory budgeting, which is an important part of our SNAC 2.0 proposal. Uh, and then finally, you know, allowing plenty of time for Q&A um, throughout. So please don't hesitate. If you have any questions, if we're not making sense about, about anything, you know, stop us, holler, raise your hand, whatever it takes <laughs> to get our attention, because um, we, we want to we make sure we're communicating well. Um, are there any, any questions about topics for today? Any questions about our agenda? Anything else? Okie doke. So I am going to share my screen then, and I'm going to attempt to share via Google Slides. I'm, I'm not the most tech savvy person, so we'll see how this goes. And I apologize for all the tech. Um, <laughs> so here we go. Slideshow. So, uh, Opening slide. These are some of the partners we've been working with. Um, I'm going to go through this rather briefly because we uh, actually did a, a similar event called the Snack Design Challenge back in February, and we really laid out a lot of our accomplishments with Snack 1.0 to date. So that is on that project page um, that I shared. And, and if you have specific questions, I'd refer to that. Um, so this will be a little quicker. And if you really want more background and context, definitely check out that, that video. It is three hours long, but um, it's good. good evening reading or evening watching. So basically this program is all based on this new, uh, this new law that was passed, AB 617, which created this new community air protection program at the Air Resources Board. Uh, and really what it's all about is helping California's most polluted communities monitor their air and then mitigate that pollution. And there are 17 of these communities around the state. Uh, there's only one formal community, however, in our region, and that's South Sacramento Florin, which was designated in 2018. Um, so our project, SNAC, um, is kind of a spinoff of that. So we secured a community air grant, which is another piece of AB 617, to begin to do that work in other communities, to begin to place air monitors, do listening sessions, organize with community members, and then analyze and collect data and start to prioritize stuff uh, that community members want to see in their neighborhoods. Uh, and Kiara, would you like to briefly just go over some of the existing conditions stuff that we did, this one on North Sac? 
Yeah, totally. Thanks, Adrian. Um, so the civic thread team put together, well, it was Walk Sacramento at the time, um, but we put together these existing conditions maps. And I want to just kind of walk you through um, how to read these first. So you'll notice that we have the boxes there, orange and um, blue, and they have data within them. They're important pointing to specific census tracts uh, within each of the communities. And the data within those boxes is representative of that specific census tracts. Census tracts. So there's four on the page and they're being compared to overall Sacramento County data, which is on the right-hand side in red. And so as you can see within the individual boxes, you're seeing a lot of red scores, which means that the data points are higher than they are uh, or worse than they are than Sacramento County. So even just like high level takeaway, we know know that um, within North Sacramento neighborhoods, we have higher exposure to diesel pollution uh, almost across the board um, for, the, for the top portion of North Sacramento. We, we, we're seeing that those, those residents are exposed to higher traffic density. Um, all the way across the board, you're seeing lower life expectancy than the rest of Sacramento County, um, and then higher rates of heart disease and asthma. Um, so, and lower community conditions. And if you can go to the next one, Adrian. Um, very similar, uh, almost across the board, you, you see that, that red popping out at you, right? There's only a few of those green uh, numbers, which means in, in, the green is, is lower than Sacramento County as a whole. So very similar, we have higher rates of traffic density, higher diesel pollution, higher rates of asthma, lower rates of life expectancy for the associated um, census tracts within Oak Park and, and uh, North Sacramento. Adrian? Thanks, Kiara. And I'm always floored by, well, I actually went too far, but I'm always floored by the stat, like north and south of Broadway, I think it's a six-year life expectancy difference. It's really just shocking. Um, so, so, you know, we did these existing conditions assessments and then began to speak with community members about where they'd like to monitor, right, as an outcome of that. So we, we work with uh, teams of, of neighbors in we each- We have the worst solution in all of Sacramento. I'm gonna mute you, Albanita. Um, so in any case, uh, uh, we were working with neighbors and then they actually identified all these locations where they wanted to monitor. Some of you are on the call, so, so please feel free to hop in if you'd like. Um, but then it was our job to say, okay, so this is where folks wanna deploy air monitors. Valley Vision gets to go uh, try to get the, the permissions uh, <laughs> From the private property owners and others to deploy these things and ultimately to put them up. Um, so that's exactly what we did. Um, so these are the these are the air monitors that we we, we deployed that are still still out there. Again, that link has uh, access to the live sort of data map showing uh, showing live air quality. We can see if that cloud is doing anything in, in the neighborhood right now. Um, but you know they measure for particulate matter, PM two point five, and then nitrogen dioxide, solar powered, uh, and then for data quality, we can co-locate them at the California Air Resources Board for four weeks. Uh, here's pictures of us deploying them in North Sac. Got some media coverage out of that. There's Kiara, there's Inchassier, there's Matthew. That was cool. Um, then we also, Breathe, uh, Breathe California Sacramento Region put together this really good air quality curriculum. So this is freely available on that website. Anybody can use it. Hit the link. Um, it's really high quality. It includes hands-on activities. It includes advocacy training stuff. It includes a lot of really good, simple, easy to understand lessons around why air quality matters. Uh, so we deployed that with Breakthrough Sacramento to 200 kids, and then Green Tech also deployed it through their program. Here are some pictures of the kids making box fan air filters, the kids learning about um, uh, air pollution via, via food coloring. So that was, that was really important. Uh, and then one big result of this, of this work was you know, monitoring the air. Um, so this, uh, this slide shows North Sacramento and basically what these are, these are one year results of air monitoring for PM 2.5 over that, over that year. It's about June to June, June 2021 to June 2022. So the top number you're seeing is the mean average. That's the, you know, the average of averages. You put them all together, you divide them by that number. Then the second number is the median. So that's the most common reading. So there are two different ways of looking at averages. Most people probably think of the top number as an average. Um, but this is really important because it shows where hotspots are in neighborhoods. It shows where disparities are in neighborhoods. And it helps us as we think about what to do about all this, it helps us put together programs and plans to address it. And SNAC 2.0, what we're gonna be talking about a little bit later is all about, okay, we've done monitoring, now what? 
Now, what are we going to do to take action? Um, so this is, again, is North Sacramento. Uh, you can see the highest readings I outlined in red. That's uh, air monitor number four at Norwood and Las Palmas. And then in Oak Park, this is the Oak Park area. So you can see the, the highest readings are in South Oak Park. They're, unfortunately, they're right next to Christian Brothers High. They're right next to Oak Ridge Elementary. They're in, they're next to Fruit Ridge Community Center, a community collaborative, you know. So really just interesting data that is really important as we think about solutions. And of course, this is all, this is all on our website. Um, again, hit the link if you haven't already. Uh, there's important stuff on there. And yeah, good to know. Z is, <laughs> Ilanka, it is, it's, it's scary stuff. Um, so in any case, whoopsie. Hey, so Adrian, are, Adrian, can I ask you real quick, on those numbers, are there more some discrete statistics like standard deviations to, to give us a better idea of, hey, what are the exceptional events like, like forest fires versus sort of normal? That's a great point. So we were not able to do that analysis. We want to do that analysis, but it's it's actually really manual labor intensive to do that. Um, we we talked to the air district. I see marks on uh, about how how intense it was. Um, but this is the thing. We have that data set, our data set publicly available on our website. It's a literally a CSV. It's a it's an Excel file that's like thirty megs. It's enormous. So all the data is public. Um, and and you know, if we could find some willing data, data scientists to kind of do that deep analysis, I think we could. This is just a very simple analysis. It doesn't even account for wildfire. Um, this is just what we're able to do with, with our resources. <laughs> so, but that's a great point, Brandon. And hey, maybe if SMUD is interesting, got some data scientists lying around, we can talk. <laughs> cool. Yes, CARB does have scientists. That's a great point. Okay, Kiara. Thanks, Adrian. Um, so a big portion of this uh, SNAC 1.0 and really SNAC 2.0 is the community engagement process. And so uh, I want to highlight two elements of the community engagement process before hopping into the community-based planning effort. And that first one is uh, the oral histories that our team led. Um, we do have a video up on our YouTube, which I'll have to get the link or Christina, if you can share it in the chat, that'd be great. Uh, where we chatted with residents in North and South, um, North Sacramento and Oak Park about their lived experience and about their own experiences with either asthma or the, um, the impacts of air quality. Uh, and then the other item that um, I wanted to share is that we did also develop a uh, education series, um, a video series online that really teaches about um, indoor and outdoor exposure and what you can do, what individual actions you can take um, and what collective actions you can take. And so we'll get the chat, we'll get those dropped in the chat so folks can check those out. Um, and then moving into the actual community-based planning portion that our team also led, uh, we worked really closely with our neighborhood coalition members uh, and used a train the trainer model to support them in engaging and delivering education to their neighbors. So part of this process, uh, we had four of our neighborhood coalition members hosting intimate listening sessions with their families, uh, their community members or their neighbors to share more about the project, understand residents' concerns and develop solutions together. Um, I don't know if we have any of those folks on the call, um, but some of those were Stacy, Inchassier, Julia, and Mary. So if you guys are in the room, hats off to y'all. Um, so the project team also developed a self-guided environmental justice tour packet. We uh, created an interactive uh, map on ArcGIS, which gave turn-by-turn -turn directions to elements that you might want to see in your community. We suggested folks go out and see some of the gas stations, some of the plants, but also some of the community resources like parks and schools um, to really get a better understanding of like how uh, air quality and how health is impacted by our built environment. Um, so residents were encouraged to take a tour through the community, uh, document their concerns, and then residents who returned their packages, uh, their environmental justice tour packets, were compensated $25. Um, and so that was a that was an incredible way to to get community to the table. Uh, and then last, what you don't see on this is our block parties. And um, there's a little bullet there, but we hosted two block parties: one in North Sacramento and one in uh, Oak Park where it was really just a celebration of all the hard work that everybody had done and especially our neighborhood coalition and PAC members. So we had a dance party, uh, we had music, we played some air quality themed games and we had some really cool um, giveaways and prizes including box filters and, plant and fans with instructions on how to create your own uh, air filter. And then um, we also gave away instant pots to 
I don't know how many we ordered, like some 30 to 50 Instant Pots that we give away um, to, to promote indoor air quality and uh, relieve people of using their gas stoves indoors. Um, and then the next slide, Adrian. And really all of this work uh, was com culminated into our commu community air action plan, uh, or like we like to call them a mini SERP, um, which, which was a key deliverable of SNAC 1.0. And so part of us putting this together, uh, we worked with our neighborhood coalition and we reviewed um, like SERPs that had been implemented in other places. One, one location that we looked at was East LA Boyle Heights to really help frame how we wanted to uh, really help guide how we wanted to frame, frame our mini SERPs. Um, so what we did is we put together one page draft lists um, of all priority actions for emission reductions. And this is based off of the feedback that we got in listening sessions, the feedback that we heard from folks through the oral histories and through that entire community-based planning process. And so our hope again, is that we can use these as, as really the base and the starting point for 2.0, which we're gonna get into next. Absolutely. And there's really good, Civic Red put together fantastic appendice documents that are also on that page that show, basically it's the, it's like the show your work part of this, right? You know, this is the final product. It's one page. Um, it'll, we, we could, we could probably make it look nicer, but uh, you know, the, the appendices are really, really important. And these are just a starting point. So, um, and then, yeah, we just want to emphasize, you know, the whole, whole idea of AB 617 is like, Hey, let's put together a plan or have residents put together a plan and then get CARB to actually enforce, enforce it, fund it, all that stuff that actually will, will mitigate pollution and address uh, neighborhood needs. So we're getting, we're done talking about SNAP 1.0. Uh, <laughs> so the next steps uh, really, really were um, uh, getting SNAP 2.0. This was an, basically our ability to continue the work with all of you. Um, so this is a grant that, that we were awarded in April of this year, uh, finally finished contracting. And really the idea behind this work, and we enjoyed working with our neighborhood coalition and advisory members on this, uh, but the, the whole goal is to like deepen those strategies, deepen those, those one-pagers, expand those one-pagers, engage more folks, and really sharpen them, I think, to make them more, more, uh, more real. Uh, and then some of the cool things that, we're, that we'd like to do as part of that, that sharpening is you know, of course, expand engagement, but also actually do an emissions reduction pilot. So we have Tyrone with Green Tech on the line, uh, and Green Tech is going to be responsible for actually implementing a, a workforce a workforce development project that will reduce emissions to some degree. And we want to work with residents to identify what that actually might look like. You know, and in other areas, of course, it could be something like tree planting or a truck reroute study or access to infrastructure, um, could be a number of things, but we really want the community to be, be able to scope that out. Henry, I see you have your hand raised. You want to unmute yourself and- Yeah, 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 real quick, sorry. Uh, so I don't get feedback. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, uh, just a reflection, you know, uh, sp speaking with some of the organizers uh, that have done environmental justice here in the city of Sacramento, specific, in particular South Sacramento, where I serve, um, you know, it's going to be some tough decisions that 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 that, air, that that gas that's on those airplanes over there on Freeport. I mean, not Freeport, but uh, that little airport they got, the Chicano Air Force. You know, right. yeah. a lot of a lot of that gas from what we're getting is is causing a lot of contamination in, in the brains. It's causing bipolar, causing behavioral personality disorders that lead to a lot of the violence. People just see violence and they think it's pop up money, but we have to pay attention to the air quality. The air quality is really causing uh, devastating. Uh, uh, effects in our people, especially in that area. And, and there's a lot of warehouses. There's a lot of warehouses and, and uh, that there's a lot of, uh, from what I'm gathering from the organizers, right? Uh, and they also planted some uh, uh, some uh, air quality event later in, in the city that I, I guess the, the city is now kind of running or whatnot. What are the big plans for, for really addressing it? I, I mean, are really going to make some tough decisions that need to be done some uh, or either you know changing the gas asking these planes will keep your airport but change the change the gasoline fuel or something right because this is having drastic results we've seen the violence a lot of the violence came from targeted areas where this air quality is horrible so it, i'm glad that we're putting some light on it i know there's a lot of organizers that worked hard to try to get it, get it on the city uh city's radar so so um so yeah uh, uh the lead in the fuel uh, is, is is really bad in South Sacramento, so I really hope that that that, that we tackle down the, the big problems, the core problems, 
and uh, and, and and make some tough tough decisions with some of the folks as we make them. You know. Yeah. No. Thank you for that. That, that is really important, and I think I think this program is is kind of the the gateway to doing that. Um, uh, and and really, am interested in maybe doing like more analysis, looking at other areas that have done these emission reduction plans through AB six seventeen, and seeing if they have dealt with their you know their their small airports. Um, and then one one important part of this that we're going to go into next really is the participatory budgeting piece. And I won't say more about it because uh, that's Civic Fred's ball game, and they're really good at talking about this really innovative and important process. But basically, we set aside a third of our budget, hundred thousand dollars. Or to be determined by residents in carrying out the project. So we'll talk more about that shortly. Um, are there any questions about kind of what, what we've been up to? Uh, and hello, hello, welcome everybody. Um, what we've been up to in terms of, you know, SNAP 1.0, um, et cetera. I just want to hop in um, and note that there are some questions in the chat, Adrian. Okay. Um, so let's see, uh, Ilanka. Was identifying reduction strategies not part of the first project? And I think, I think that's it, but I'll, I'll scan again to let you know. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so check out the action plans. Those are, again, a beginning point of we we're going to do prioritize actions. I think SNAC 2.0 is a really good way to basically deepen the strategies, try to figure out, you know, what, what, are, what are our community priorities and then what can we, you know, kind of what's most strategic and doable uh, in terms of that. I think Henry, your, your hand has been out by Herman. Hi, everybody. This is Herman with the Sacramento EJ Coalition. Uh, we're going to be looking into um, gathering data on uh, lead in the air when it comes to the bloodstream in children and families. Once we gather that data, would you or SNAC be willing to add that to your report um, as we move forward with some policy recommendations? Yeah. Absolutely. It sounds super relevant. Yeah. And then, um, Edmond, unless you, if you're finished up, I want to highlight some additional comments in the chat. Um, Mary, welcome, Mary. Mary is one of our awesome Neighborhood Coalition members. Um, she's asking if we have the PowerPoint available to those who joined late. And then second question is, is the action plan set or can some more things be added? Plan is certainly not set. We this was a one-page starting point. Snack 2.0 is again about like really building this out, trying to trying to expand these strategies uh, and engage more folks, get more input into them. Um, and then yes, the PowerPoint we'll make available. We're recording this. We'll make the recording available. Put it on Valley Vision's YouTube uh, or elsewhere if the project team would like to be somewhere else. So. And then, yeah, Richard pointing out that they have United Latinos as a monitor at Mangan Park near the airport as well. Any other questions? Questions about kind of where we've been? Okay. Well, um, Civic Thread Team, actually, okay. This first, then we'll go to the participatory budgeting piece. So this is what we proposed to CAR uh, in terms of basically like a timeline of doing the work for SNAC 2.0. Uh, and we'll talk more about the participatory budgeting thing because really we feel like that's the first thing we got to figure out. Because uh, if we want to spend money doing stuff, we need to have a way, a process for, you know, that, that those funds to be utilized in carrying out the work. So we really feel like participatory budgeting is step one. Um, and then, and then uh, we'll, you know, we'll, we want your input into that process and then there will be more opportunities, of course. Um, I see Alanka question. That's a really good point. So um, basically, she, Ilanka is asking, is there somewhere where we can see all the monitors, you know, whether they're federal and state or elsewhere? Um, so no, and that's a problem. That's a problem. Um, so the, the state of California is supposed to be working on this. And, and Ilanka, you may know about this. Maybe Brandon does as well. They're supposed to be working on this thing called AQ View. And actually, I think we have CARB on the call. Um, but AQ View is supposed to be a hub of basically where you'd put all of those monitors, all that monitoring data. So it's, it's in one place for community members to look at. Um, so that's what AQV is supposed to be. I think it's been a few years and, uh, and, and, uh, <laughs> and it's still not here. So hopefully, hopefully we can work with CARB to make sure that you know, our data from our monitors and of course regulatory data and elsewhere is all included in one place. So yeah. does that answer your question, Alonka? 
So basically, carbs, yes. carbs on. Um, also, I guess I just wanted to flag, you know, there's um, there's more monitors coming online from other programs too. So it would be good, like if you are engaging with CARB on like, hey, let's, let's make sure that all of them are in there, right? Like regardless of jurisdiction or funding source. Yeah, 100%. Erman, did you still have your hand up or can I go to Tony? Oh yes, yeah, sorry, that's not me. Uh, I'll put okay. it down. No worries, Tony. Yeah, there's an, um, <clears throat> another web presence that has, that compiles uh, data on air quality called OpenAQ. And so, but until the Air Resources Board develops their presence for this, you can go to OpenAQ and you can see a lot of what's going on with local air quality and all the different, a lot of the different sensors end up feeding somehow into OpenAQ. Got it. Yeah, that's a really good point. Okay, any other questions about you know, this timeline or, or SNAC 1.0 where we've been before we start talking about participatory budget, which is a fun topic. All righty. Well, feel free to, you know, ask questions in the chat, raise your hand, whatever's needed. Um, I'm going to pass it over then to, you want me to keep sharing my screen, Civic Red Team? Yeah, if, if that's okay, Adrian, that'd be really helpful. Okay, go for it. Going through my double screens right now. Hi everyone, I'm Christina. I'm a project manager here with Civic Thread. Um, we'll start off right with um, community participatory budgeting. Some of you may already be familiar with it. Um, some of you, this may be a new concept. Um, so I'll just start off with an overview. Uh, our organization is excited to support a participatory budgeting process that's going to be developed and co-led by North Sac and Oak Park community members. So um, in case you didn't know, a community participatory budgeting process also known as a CPB, which I'll probably be referring to because it's a long name. It's a democratic process in which community members decide on how to spend part of a public budget. And in this project, um, that would be the mentioned 100,000 um, that Adrian said, or part of that will also be dedicated to stipends. So currently, the city of Sacramento is conducting a pilot participatory budgeting process for Measure U funds. And I think I see some faces in here that may have been involved, and um, I invite you to share more later about um, that experience. A um, participatory budgeting program is supporting them with these endeavors and the images that are on the screen here are actually taken from their organization scoping toolkit. Um, you can see in the infographic on the left, a high level overview of what a PB process looks like. Um, from designing um, the structure, idea collection through community, utilizing that community feedback to develop proposals, presenting those proposals for a vote and then implementation and funding. Um, the table on the right outlines the expected timeline. It's a little, um, it's a little small, so I'll share a link where you could download that toolkit for your own reading. Um, but the table on the right does outline the expected timeline, and we anticipate this to run on more on the longer side that it states, um, around 12 months, as we work together to explore territory and build something that best represents the community. So I'm going to just click the link here in the chat in case you want to download that. Um, could I get the next slide, Adrian? Um, so how does this incorporate into SNAC? So if you look at the table earlier, um, we're in the planning and designing phase, which is at the top, and working to form groups to help set this process up, which is why you're all here. Um, on the screen, you're gonna see how you may be able to participate. So at the top there, decision makers will comprise strictly community members who live in North Sacramento, or Oak Park who will have the final say of what's going on in their neighborhoods. And there's also opportunities for non-residents and residents who just don't wanna be part of that decision-making process to help build out the governance structure. Um, and we'd like to lean on your interests and expertise to help shape this process. And depending on the varying interests um, of what you wanna work on, there is opportunity for subcommittees to be formed. Um, and eligible participants, of course, are gonna be receiving stipends for the role in this process. And then the next slide. So I'm gonna stop talking now. Um, I invite you all, if you have any questions or have direct experience supporting or participating in a PB, we invite you to plug it in the chat box or if you wanna raise your hand to share it out. I see Fatima. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, I, I guess um, I don't really have a lot of experience with the participatory budgeting process, but um, I, I guess I'm just really concerned about um, the voting aspect because I think it really deters from 
addressing, I think, just the long-term and ingrained equity issues of just democratic processes in general. Um, oftentimes, I think folks, um, you know, from high poverty neighborhoods tend to not be as civically engaged or inclined. And so I'm just really concerned that would this process be as accessible, you know, again, uh, for the communities that hopefully you're wanting to focus on. So I guess just at first glance, um, not a fan of the voting process, just because again, I think from an equity standpoint, I don't think that would address it. Um, and then the other um, experience I do have recently with a separate group um, that I've been a part of is uh, participatory grant making, which I know is more philanthropic in nature as opposed to government, which I think, again, you know, like the measure you and this process is very government uh, driven. But there are models that I'm happy to share in the philanthropic world around participatory grant making that I think would be far more equitable in addressing um, just the need to really support the involvement of folks who have not been involved in processes like these. Thanks, Fatima, um, for raising those concerns and definitely see that. I mean, it is a realistic anecdote of what society is and how government does work and just like who's able to access um, voting and participating in these structures. And I think like my perspective is it really relies on who is creating the process, right? And making sure that those gaps are addressed and that um, making sure that the people we really truly want to target um, are brought to the table and are at the highest priority. So being sure that is ingrained in developing the process from the get-go, being sure that is um, a norm and a standard that we set. But I'm, um, you know, open to seeing the models that you are mentioning. Um, I know we have scoped a participatory budgeting pilot program um, for SNAC 2.0, um, but, you know, I think there's flexibility with how to design a process that best suits the community and what they want. So um, would love to see options. I think Herman has his hand up. Uh, yes, uh, where specifically is, is the participatory budgeting happening in South and North SAC? Do you have a neighborhood a neighborhood name or a district that we can identify? We, we don't at the moment. We're still planning the participatory budgeting element of this project, um, which our first step is to consult with our community before we make any decisions, um, which is part of the reason we're talking about it now with you all today. So is, is, are there a lot of environmental issues in North SAC? Is that what I'm hearing too? How, how was that decided? I think there are. Uh, I think the uh, earlier in the presentation we had, a, we shared an existing conditions graphic that showed just some of the disparities of, between census tracts and North Sacramento that I think did a pretty good job. I could try to go back to it. Um, was it bigger than South Sacramento? Because, I mean, we got a lot of complaints from, like, the hospitals. Uh, a, a lot of people uh, uh, have suffered casualties. Like, everything you guys mentioned uh, has been happening for years, uh, especially with the brown and black communities. All, all throughout the South, you know, all the way to Middle View, all the way to Fruit Ridge, all the way, you, you know, to Oak Park, you know what I'm saying? And, um, you know, uh, how far into Oak Park are you guys going? Do we know? Yeah, so you can see here, um, this first one's North Sacramento, but Adrian, if you want to go over to that Oak Park one, it does incorporate um, right there, the South border is Fruit Ridge that you can see. Um, and so this is the slide that Adrian was talking about where, as you can see, just even from a high level and not really even getting into the details, um, it's, it's almost right across the board and for both graphics. And so uh, both of these communities are exposed to higher rates of traffic density, diesel pollution, um, and, and comorbidities, heart disease, um, asthma rates than the rest of Sacramento County. Um, so we know that these communities are exposed to higher rates of pollution. Um, we know that the, the their environmental justice communities, they have big uh, freeways running through them, um, big arterials that are running through them. They don't have 
uh, built environment characteristics that support things like walking and biking, right? So everybody who's traveling through is using a car. We know that there are industrial facilities within these communities um, where, I mean, I, I live right next to the freeway and the bimbo factory in Oak Park. Uh, so you have a lot of those emissions coming from the semi trucks that are coming through, but also from the production of the facilities themselves. So um, does that help answer your question, Henry? Yes, great. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you for the question. Yeah, there was a um, possibly a follow-up question by Allegra in the chat. Um, so why are we not focusing on those areas? Just wanting some clarity. Allegra, can you clarify on, on why are we not focusing on which areas? Yes. So I saw that you said you're focusing on the two areas, uh, North Area and Oak Park. There's always a lot of concentration in Oak Park with uh, Fruit Ridge Manor just being less than three miles away. I'm just curious as to why are you not focusing on these other areas that you mentioned that you guys are aware of that they have higher rates and yet you're focusing on Oak Park and uh, North Area. So can you explain, clarify that or give me some yes, understanding? Yes, I can, I can explain half of that. So the graphics that we were showing that have the higher rates, um, th those are the areas that we're focusing in. And the project does encompass areas of Fruit Ridge. Uh, so it's Lawrence Park, Oak Park, and uh, portions of Fruit Ridge. So those are the areas that we're focused on. And I'd like to pass to Adrian um, because I think Val, I, I wasn't a part of this project when, when the initial communities were selected, so I'm not entirely sure. But I do know that there is a formal AB 617 process that's going on in South Sacramento, which is likely why we uh, didn't focus our efforts there. Adrian? Yeah, yeah. So the this and we have we have folks from the Sacramento Metro Air District on the line with us, but they've nominated North Sacramento and then the Oak Park Fruit Ridge area for AB 617 consideration. Their area that they've nominated includes a larger area than we've been working in. So their area includes all of South Natomas. It goes east more into Del Paso Heights in the north. And in the south area, theirs goes south to uh, 47th Avenue uh, uh, as well. And so it's just a larger area than what we've been working in. And I think there's certainly an opportunity and a desire to expand you know, the work that we've been doing. Hopefully that answers answers your question. I have a quick question. Yeah, go go ahead. Um, so I, I like your maps. Thank you. I was able to take a screenshot of this. And I've been following the snack project from the beginning. We we, we understand your focus areas uh, because there are there are around areas that um that are changing right now. There's a lot of gentrification happening there. But we know at Saki JC that there are worse areas with pollution issues, like the middle view, like uh, garden land. These areas historically keep, for, keep getting forgotten in any kind of aid to include environmental justice efforts. So is there a chance that we can modify the this effort so we can go to the areas that are even that have chronic health conditions uh, outside of these two maps you show? I think it's possible. I, I hope that will be part of the AB 617 process, um, you know, of advocating for our community. I think, you know, when it comes to us advocating for, you know, us to actually get resources to address this stuff, um, we should be advocating for a larger area than just what we've been working on, for sure. Um, I don't know, you know, I don't know in terms of just like the immediacy, you know, the immediacy of the participatory budgeting, kind of where that's going to be focused, but that's why we want to get, and, and we'll get, you know, into a little bit more of, of next steps soon, but we want to start with the PB, uh, and then I think that'll help shape a lot of what the project will look like. Uh, and I think we also don't want to, you know, don't want to try to dilute the work. Um, you know, it's been, these are already big areas. Uh, we've made a lot of really good connections and of course, you know, can certainly certainly want to make more, um, but uh, just want to be respectful to the, the neighbors we've been working with too. So it's, it's going to be a balance. <laughs> and Adrian, I know we have Fatima's hand up, but Allegra mentioned in the chat that she has another question. So Allegra. Okay, so I'm so glad that the person uh, before me mentioned gentrification. So listen, I know that you, if you guys are really doing this research right and you know that your stats, your own graphs indicate higher rates of challenge in certain areas. 
I'm, for the life of me, I'm wondering why are you focusing on Oak Park instead of Meadowview, where there's a high rate of cancer? I, I don't understand. Would that be because of the new clientele in Oak Park versus the old people that were there? So, I mean, we know that that's a low income area. We know for a fact that cancer is on a high in that area. We know that there's radiation in the Meadowview area. For the life of me, I can't figure out, you know, if you really want to get real stats, wouldn't it be better to focus on the areas that have the higher rates instead of these new gentrified areas? I mean, I, I don't disagree with you, uh, but I do, I do think, um, you know, a good, a good resource for, for air quality data is our, is our air district. They did an analysis of Meadowview, of Oak Park, of North Sacramento, of uh, Gardenland Northgate, of um, all sorts of actually 10 different areas around uh, their jurisdiction. Uh, and they, they've been collecting data. Sadly, there's a lot of areas that are still air monitoring deserts, which is what AB617 is trying to address. Um, but there's a lot of really helpful data that I think you can find there. We're happy to share some of the, the links there. But we've been focusing on two of the two of the areas that you know really do have issues, uh, and as as demonstrated by the, these graphics. Right, um, and they're also and, and they're also the new newly uh, developed areas that are gentrified. We need to make that real clear. It appears as though you want to take care of these new areas where they're predominantly white people, but you don't want to take care of the areas of where the black poor people are or lower income people that's getting cancer and dying. That don't make any sense. Thank you for your input. We, we really hope you'll, you'll engage with us in this work you know, to try to improve it. Oh, I will. Thank you so much. Henry Ortiz invited me out. Thank you so much, Henry and Christina. I see Fatima. Fatima, is your hand still up? Okay, let's go to, oh, go ahead, Fatima. Uh, I think I, I lost connection there for a minute. Um, is it my turn? Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I, I just want to appreciate what Armand had mentioned about other neighborhoods. Um, I, I also think that, you know, um, you know, place does matter and it's really important um, to certainly acknowledge that there is a lot, there are a lot of neighbors and a lot of issues in each neighborhood. And I think um, you all have been working really hard. I think this is what the second year, or maybe longer of this project. And um, you know, you you also have presented a lot of data. And so I think to the extent that we can, you know, be data informed of you know what other areas certainly have have needs. And I, um, you know, I, I think you even this map you have up right now it it kind of shows a lot of the disparities. And I think, um, I, you know, I, I certainly understand that there is a lot of, um, you know, demographic shifts going on in Oak Park. And so I definitely acknowledge that, at least in Del Paso Heights, um, which I've been in for 20 plus years now, um, you know, I, I certainly think that the data here suggests that this is an important area to focus on. Um, and so I, I certainly appreciate you all doing that because I know for the past 10 years with BHC, there's been a lot of investment in South Sac and there's a lot of investments in other parts of the city. Um, yes, Northgate has its needs as well. And so um, while there are many places, I, I really just want to uh, thank you all for the work you've done and to just continue to, to be data driven and, and, you know, um, addressing a lot of these place-based concerns and, and issues. Thank you, Fatima. I appreciate that. Um, Mary? Yeah, thank you. I wanted to just piggyback on what Fatima has said. Um, she pretty much uh, said most of what I wanted to say already, um, but I want to do add that um, I understand that there are different areas in Sacramento that have needs, right? I think there's a lot of areas in Sacramento that has needs um, and we can easily identify them. But, um, you know, I think it's very important for this project to really um, focus on where the need is and based on the data that I see um, and have been shared, um, North Sacramento and Oak Park, and I'm sure Metaview too. I don't want to not discredit that, but um, 
the numbers are here, you know, we're looking at it right now. Um, and so I feel like, you know, I don't think that this project is, you know, discriminating against anything or any other areas of Sacramento. I feel like, shoot, you know, I'm a resident of North Sac and as long as there is something bettering my life, my family's life, um, my neighbor's life, just finding a solution to better my quality of life, I'm grateful. And so I um, want to thank, you know, all those who have been working, you know, tirelessly on this project um, to even care enough, you know, about the air that I breathe uh, means a lot to me. So um, I also want to say thank you. Thank you, Mary. And um, you were critical in 1.0. Couldn't, couldn't have done it without you. So really appreciate your, your role in supporting this project. Um, Zach? Zach, yeah. Yeah, Go ahead. thank you. Um, just definitely want to echo as well. Uh, really appreciate all the effort that's gone into the North Sac and South Sac. Uh, you know, getting these all these monitors installed. I can't even imagine how much of an effort it is, but um, <clears throat> really appreciate it. I wanted to ask uh, Adrian or whoever it's best suited to, uh, the Sacramento Tree Foundation in partnership with SMUD is about to release a tool that's like a uh, uh, ArcGIS uh, study um, that was done with LIDAR over Sacramento showing on a per parcel basis uh, what the tree canopy is. And it's not released to the public yet. They said at the last summit, it's going to be released in the next month or so. But I feel like it would be super cool to try to like relate this data to that and show like the disparities with air quality relating also to tree canopy in some of these underserved areas. Um, so yeah, just curious if you guys are have any plans to do anything in that realm. We were certainly interested. I mean, one of the top topics that came up was like the lack of tree canopy. And let's be honest here, folks, if we overlay an EJ map, if we overlay a demographics map, if we overlay the tree canopy lap, we're gonna, we're gonna see that they're concentrated in the same areas. There's not tree canopy in our communities of color, in our low-income communities of color. There's not active transportation infrastructure. There's freeways running through. Like you're gonna see those same things throughout Sacramento. So that would certainly be something we are interested in seeing and overlaying with the data, um, this data on the screen, but also the data we're collecting with the air monitors. Adrian? Yeah, hundred percent. And this is, I think this ties back to participatory budgeting. You know, if community members want to do something, then they, then we're, we're basically enabling those folks to, um, you know, to determine how they want to spend this, this budget. So I think that could be a great opportunity for additional, if folks want to do additional analysis, deeper analysis, leverage other things, that'd be a really good, maybe use of participatory budgeting, but it's not going to be my decision. It's going to be a community member's decision. But yeah, really cool tool. Sure. And I think Henry's next. But yeah, um, I just wanted to emphasize, you know, as we're investing in Oak Park and uh, and uh, the, like the Paso, all these main strip, strips, right, that now have been gentrified, right? Let's not forget about the people way in the back in the outskirts where all the empty land is at, where all the pollution and little warehouses are at. You know what I'm saying? Well, th those are the people right there that we deal with and we hear it from them. And as we're making these decisions, we have to be thorough in, in our research and I just kind of get some general ideas of some people that don't even live in these communities, giving some general uh, 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 collective ideas, right? That the data show, shows uh, what it shows. And so, um, but, but also the violent rates are showing what it shows. If you map out the violent rates and you correlate it with air pollution, along with the targeting of policing, you know what I'm saying? And, and lack of resources, it's all going to correlate. Right, but of course, our main focus in this discussion is 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 the quality of our air. We all want air quality, uh, as we're striving to get air quality in all our community and, and some of these communities. Let's not forget about all the communities, right? Especially those that are constantly at, at the emergency rooms, uh, suffering from asthma, dying, um, you know, from adverse childhood experiences, right, due to the high, horrific uh, pollution and already stressors that they deal with every day. You know, I mean, if we can uh, advocate to yeah, at least put certain little strips or streets 
you know, uh, that, that uh, uh, you know, reaches out to uh, deep, deep in the south of South Sac and also deep in Del Paso Heights, because there's a lot, Del Paso Heights has got a lot of struggle, a lot of pain, you know what I'm saying? Every time I go to that community, like, even, I'm not even original, I can feel the struggle, just like I feel it in South Sac. And both of these communities are in desperate need. Let's just make sure that we're not only uh, cleaning up all the gentrified areas, and it looks good in theory for the city officials, uh, you know, it, but it's, it's, it's still leaving out the people that have been crying uh, for help for the past 30 years on, on this matter. 100% agree with you, Henry. Thank you for your comment. Hey, Kiara, can I add something? Yeah. Um, so one thing to note is, you know, there's this isn't the only air monitoring effort that's, that's happening, right? We have a lot of partners, Friends of United Latinos, the Air District, uh, the city of Sacramento is also about to deploy 100 air monitors around the city. Um, I understand they had their RFP out. I'm not sure who bid it on it. Hopefully, hopefully someone will be putting those out in the community. So I think we're going to be getting a lot more data about where hotspots are in our neighborhoods. It'll be really inform, I think, us kind of as a regional, uh, on a regional scale, knowing where to, where to prioritize. Um, so just know that there are a lot of other really great air monitoring efforts happening that are really important to to be tracking as we think about the opportunity. And then um, I'm gonna, I see two hands and I, and I know both folks have chatted before. So I'm just gonna elevate a comment in the chat from Naila, um, who's, she's, she mentioned that she loved, actually Naila, do you mind coming off mute and just sharing what you wrote in the chat and asking your questions? Yep, I wrote it way more eloquently. Let me pull it up. <laughs> um, just read it. I, I think uh, I really appreciate all the passion. And I think um, one of the things that I'm noticing is just there's a bunch of air quality efforts. And Adrian, it's exactly what you were just mentioning. There's a bunch of air quality efforts and efforts happening across the city. Is there any way that this is going to plug in to other efforts? How can it for communities that aren't selected? How do they get to participate? Is there some benefit to them as well? And anything along those lines would be helpful to hear. Yeah, thanks, Nicola. I'll take the first stab. I mean, we we know that air quality doesn't know borders, right? Like air quality is going to travel outside of the designated space that we have allocated for this project. And so we certainly want to be tied into the other air quality projects that are going on and, and certainly want to hear from residents in Sacramento, Sac the Sacramento region as a whole, because no matter where you live, um, air quality doesn't discriminate. It's going to find you. So uh, one of the things that we've been doing is having a series of conversations with our air quality management district, um, with some of our partners like United Latinos who have their own separate monitoring system underway to make sure that we're engaged with their process and they're engaged with our process. So Richard, uh, who's on the call, he is one of our PAC members and hopefully will be joining us for 2.0. We've had some discussion with Kevin on you, Kevin Hernandez on the United Latinos team as well, who's their data expert in really trying to explore ways that we can collaborate um, and we can really tackle this air quality issue. And I know Adrian has a bunch of other examples of how we're trying to connect this to other air quality monitoring um, efforts in the region, including AB 617. So I will go ahead and pass it over to Adrian. Yeah, well, I'm not going to add much, just that, you know, AB 617 is, is kind of a, a big play opportunity, for lack of a better phrase, um, for, for us. But there's also, you know, SB 1000, there's, there's other planning efforts that are happening. And there's, you know, Naila, as you know, well, there are too many planning efforts happening uh, for people to be able to meaningfully track. But um, I think AB 617 is, is the big play, but there are certainly other things that we should be looking at and thinking about and really appreciate and, and interested in like recommendations for how we can make sure that we're aligning things. Because um, alignment is so important and it's something that just doesn't get prioritized enough. Yeah, I am not sure about order, but I'm gonna go with Fatima because you're the first in line. Do you still have a question, Fatima? Yeah, uh, uh, I do have a question. Um, this question is for Adrian. Um, going back to the uh, participatory budget, is the intent of these funds that will be uh, um, allocated, is it to further uh, additional monitoring efforts or uh, will it also be for the purpose purposes of, uh, let's say, mitigating some of the bad air quality? So is it in the implementation phase yet, or would it just further enhance monitoring efforts? I'll, I'll go first and then maybe add here, 
Tara can add on the PD thing. Um, so this isn't an air monitoring. This is not an air monitoring grant. Snack 1.0 was really focused on air monitoring. What we got, what we heard from residents is like, okay, let, what are we going to do about this? Let's take action. So Snack 2.0, and I can go back to the timeline, is really about piloting an emission reduction uh, pilot and, and deepening our strategies. And whatever it takes to do that is what that pot of funds is for. And again, residents will be the ones determining the, that pot of funds. Um, but it, but I, I don't think monitoring was the, the, the intent, but I think it certainly could be. Uh, so, so that's, that's kind of a half answer. <laughs> But, but the second the second part of that is that we do we want to pilot something so there is implementation um, incorporated in this effort as well. That's good. That's that's great. Thank you. I was I was hoping for that. So that's that's awesome. Um, and then actually just just to follow up with uh, Adrian, what you mentioned about the city conducting additional monitoring, I think that's actually really um, timely given that we've just heard from uh, at least you know Northgate and the other neighborhoods that were mentioned you know, where there is a need for some of those air monitoring um, efforts to take place. And so I think that's, that is a, a really good resource to perhaps, as you mentioned, coordinate in a line as additional monitoring takes place. Yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely, great points. Um, Edman, do you have another question? Okay, or comment? Yeah, yes, a question. Uh, the EJC, has committed that our definition of environmental justice will include uh, fighting displacement and gentrification. Is this group equipped to state publicly that they will also move their efforts in the spirit of not displacing the 20,000 low-income people that are in the Oak Park city zip codes? Is, is that a possible statement that you can make uh, on, on top of your environmental justice effort? That would be really speak. motivational for me. I can't speak for the full group, and I think we'd have to get them all in the room. Um, but I certainly don't see an issue with Civic Thread making some sort of statement on along those lines. Uh, we we are engaged in uh, a number of anti um activities, and and it's something that we think is absolutely critical when we're talking about investing in communities. Um, so yeah, we we wouldn't have a problem making that statement and. Again, can't speak on behalf of the whole project because um, there's other players involved, but I don't anticipate that would be an issue. Would Valley Vision, uh, Adrian, be willing to do that public statement? Adrian Wren can, uh, I can, <laughs> but I'd have to, I don't know, I'd talk to Evan. I don't see a problem with that. Um, you know, the, the complexity comes from what might happen with, you know, if we get an AB 617 designation and people and community members want a bunch of EV chargers, right? That's where things get a little bit more complex. You know, the how really matters in terms of how we're going to alleviate air pollution issues. Um, and so, you know, I'm very interested in, you know, in learning more and having a conversation about how do we make sure that, you know, the things that we're that are coming into our communities to try to address the air pollution issues um, don't displace people. But but Adrian Wren can certainly say uh, say that you know um, we are. This is not an effort to gentrify the neighborhood. Um, I, you know, so. No, no, no. What I'm saying is that, no, no, I'm not, I'm not asking for you guys to say you're going to gentrify. What I'm asking for is, will you seek to make a public statement that you're going to help the community combat displacement and how that helps forms in an environmental justice context, it would be up to the group, of course, but is that something you can seek? I, I yeah, me personally, absolutely. Yeah. And then I'll just add, I mean, Edmond, you, you know that um, I've been in, the Civic Thread team has in been engaged with Sacramento Investment Without Displacement. So this, so this is an issue that we are acutely aware of and closely follow. Kevin? Hey, sorry. Um, yeah, thank you for for having me, and 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 I really really appreciate this conversation. Um, <clears throat> the priorities for Snack 2.0, which Adrian mentioned, you mentioned was, um, you know, having some sort of plan for mitigating bad air quality, and also uh, deepening your strategies. Um, just from 
like a data perspective from where I'm coming from, I think one of the main barriers for making sure that you can successfully um, meet those priorities is going to be collaboration specifically with all of the air quality monitors and all of the monitoring that's going on. Like you're going to need all that data because you on your own are not going to be able to monitor one or two neighborhoods. And like you mentioned, Kira, like bad air quality affects us all. So we can be having bad air quality in one neighborhood <clears throat> and because of the wind patterns or whatever the case, you know, Gardenland uh, could be crystal clean that day or vice versa. So I think it's really important that um, as part of your plan to go forward and getting community buy-in that we really address how and what the best way is to collaborate, especially on all this powerful data so we can really leverage it to make decisions. Yeah, absolutely, Kevin. And I think, um, you know, that's why it was critical for us to form partnerships with UL and SNAC 1.0. And, you know, we've been hosting meetings with uh, folks that are about to deploy air monitors throughout the region um, and folks that already have, because I think you're right, collaboration is going to be key here. Um, and and back, to the, back to the points that were made earlier, it would be great to see all of this data compiled in one place. Um, you know, I've had some very, very preliminary conversations with SMUD um, about their, their sustainable resources priorities map. Uh, I think that would be a great place, place for it to live, just throwing it out there in case there's any board SMUD members uh, on the line. Um, but I, I certainly see opportunities for collaboration. And again, that's why you guys are all here. We, we want to make sure that we're bringing folks to the table and that we're bringing the right folks to the table. Richard? Thank you. I have been listening in. It's been really interesting, stimulating, and, and frankly, heartbreaking conversation for a lot of the areas that have been seeking representation when it comes to this particular subject. On behalf of United Latinos, I want to say I value our partnership with Valley Vision 350 Sacramento. Many of you that are out there doing the work, ECOS and others that are there. And I want to let this group know, for those of you that don't know me, and I put a, I've reached out to a couple of you individually, please feel free to reach out to me on behalf of United Latinos or personally and related to things along Northgate, related to things along Meadowview, related to other areas that have systemically been overlooked and seem to be continued to be overlooked. Because I can tell you and the people here, some of the people here are on this call that have been involved with United Latinos and other projects that we are looking to expand into those areas of need. I've been in touch with a number of community people in Meadowview. We have been partnering with the Gardenland Neighborhood Association on uh, what we can do for them. We must all come together. We cannot separate ourselves out from them versus us or whatever it is for everybody that is on this call. We must come together, learn to work together, no matter what our histories or past may be, because that's the only way it is going to happen. And I understand the distrust. I understand, you know, believe me, I've got my misgivings about so many things that are going on in there. But we must continue the fight, we must continue to collaborate, and we must continue to go forward. So I welcome anyone to reach out, join, and let's see what we can make sure, what we can do to make things equitable across the plane. And it's going to take time, and it takes a lot of time, unfortunately. But I'm here for the long haul. I'm here for the fight. I know United Latinos is here for the fight. Kevin is a representative of our team. We've got an air monitor there on the Franklin Corridor. We've got an air monitor at Mangum Park. We're looking to expand. We expanded out to Northgate. We're looking to expand beyond this. So let us know how we can help. And personally, I'm also on the participatory budgeting project that is under that pilot. So to this group, as you look on your participatory budgeting and how that might work or how that might come to pass, I offer myself as a resource to you. So please feel free to reach out where you can and I'm willing to talk to anybody. Well, you know we'll be reaching out, Richard. Thank you. Um, I, I think we're at Tyrone and then Allegra next. Tyrone? Uh, 
Thanks, Kiara. Um, so again, I've been enjoyed listening to the um, dialogue. I think it's very, very important. Um, I'm not going to lay out specifically a plan as much as we look forward to the collaboration and the inclusionary thinking to come up with uh, effective workforce plans. For example, all of the all of the uh, work that this project is about is going to require, um, you know, people that take on different roles, different jobs, different careers, if you will, and so. It, it, we really need to kind of lay out what that looks like, what kinds of jobs we're talking about, everything from uh, monitor, you know, people making monitors to learning how to how to uh, implement monitors or to say EV mechanics or or even EV drivers. Uh, so there's there's a broad spectrum uh, in the in the new green the new green economy. So we really need the input an idea in terms of developing their workforce. So no matter whatever the implementation project is coming up with, there has to be the people that are going to do it. So again, I'm just looking forward to uh, your inclusion and your ideas uh, to make to, to put together a very powerful workforce uh, for, for the future. Adrian, I'm not seeing any additional questions or comments either in the chat or with hands raised. So I will pass to you. Great. And I think you all might have had this slide. You want to speak to this slide? Or should I speak to this slide? I'll pass to Christina. Sure. Um, just wanted to first make space to say, really appreciate the conversation that's been had. Um, if anything, that just translates to all of the lived experience and the people that experience it daily. Um, being able to shape this process and to make it equitable. Um, so with that, I invite you all to um, take the survey. There's a QR code, or you could just plug in this um, link in your browser or phone, whatever you're using. Um, it's a quick survey, really, just to see if you're interested in participating, where you see yourself um, in shaping this process, where whether it's decision-making or um, governance structure building, um, any level of expertise, any interests, you know, walks of life really do invite it. And the more diverse, really, the better. Can you uh, copy and paste that link text? Yeah, to the chat? I, can, um, I can do that right now. Just to, you know, I got fat fingers. I might have probably mistyped that. It's easier to click, I think, the link than to type. So got you. These QR codes are pretty cool. Okay, so yeah, that please take the survey. Um, that's really, I think, kind of the you know the the way in which folks can determine how they'd like to plug in with the process moving forward. As as stated by the Civic Red team, the participatory budgeting thing is the thing we want to figure out first because we're going to want to like spend money and do stuff via that process to carry out the work. So that's that's step one. Um, so I'm really excited for Civic Thread to to lead that uh, developing the governance structure there. Uh, and then Valley Vision will be responsible for the back end, the, the, the paying and, and the, the other stuff, the, the less fun stuff. <laughs> so looking forward to that. Um, so here are just some contact uh, information for each of the, the organizational leads. So if you'd like to reach out, um, you know, this is easy. Um, uh, yeah, we'll do, for, you know, email first. Uh, of course, all of us have cell phones. All are available via cell phone. And, uh, if you prefer to reach out, in that way, just let us know in the chat uh, and we'll, we're happy to follow up. Um, with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and just ask if there's any other questions, comments, um, just clarifying next steps. It looks like Brandon, you have your hand raised. I um, want to say a couple of things. One, Adrian, I heard some questions tonight. This process has been going on for about five, five or six years now, um, right as I was coming up being president of ECOS, this was getting going. So some of these questions that were uh, posed, like uh, why are these communities chosen? Um, there's a whole body, and I was not on this, so I don't know, but somebody does. And, and I think you need to try to go get some straight answers uh, about how we are, well, sorry, why it looks like the way it is right now, right? And you can go back to the meeting minutes going back to 2018 
Um, and I know Spencer, lots of staff was there, but, but I, I, there's no reason to have the, these be an open question. Um, as to sort of these communities are bounded by the 617 guidelines, you know, with the idea uh, we're going to be very targeted to try to clean up air quality uh, and develop new programs at that local level and really try to make a difference and then expand those elsewhere. And that's, I think, I think that's my interpretation. And I think that's where we see this um, 2.0 where, hey, we've done the monitoring. Now it's time to start taking some real concrete details. And this participa participatory budget process is about deciding what actions to take. I, th I think that's sort of the main takeaway that we're you're looking, looking for. Um, and this is not my community, so I, always, I tried with a very light hand, right? Local Locals need to make that decision. But I would love it if you could, if you could guys go back, interview whoever you need to interview, and, and get some straight answers uh, about some of the questions posed tonight. Uh, and then two, uh, I know Samad, I know uh, Jose Bodipo Memba, who, who's our Sustainable, Sustainable Communities Director, has, has been involved with this since the start. Uh, if you look at the areas that were selected, they match up in the, the brightest red on SMUD's heat map, which is a, a map that SMUD put together that's composite of a whole bunch, like a dozen different metrics. Um, and so they definitely overlap really well. And I know the SMUD staff uses that map when they're doing things like uh, selecting areas to put in charging stations. You know, they go and consult that heat map. Uh, and target specific areas. So I know SMED is definitely willing to partner in. And we do fund a big chunk of the Tree Foundation. Um, so if there's if there's room to expand our programs, I know uh, that SMED is certainly open to having uh, more communication and more engagement for sure. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. thank you for calling out some of the history that was, so, you know, this project we've been monitoring for a year, but you're right in saying that, you know, car, air districts, et cetera, the, the work that they've done to and identify geography goes back a lot further. So yeah, we should we should circle back to those folks and, and, and ask some questions. And I, I put, posted the uh, SMUD map, the Sustainable Communities map that uh, Brandon or Director Rose was uh, was uh, talking about. Kevin. Um, I just want to echo what Brandon said about just making sure we really get those open questions answered, especially about how communities were selected, because I think a large part of, you know, folks' concerns and even my concerns is really like trust. Like, where is the trust? Like, can, can we trust this project to actually really deliver and also not only deliver, but deliver on what the community wants, right? So um, I think step one is clearing any air and being as transparent as possible, um, especially when it comes to something like where are we going to put our resources into, right? So I, I appreciate you, Brandon, for bringing that up. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I can tell you now, you know, a lot of, a lot of it came from the, the SAC Metro Air District. Uh, you know, we have, we have Mark on the call. Uh, they put together an analysis of, you know, what they thought the 10, you know, the 10 uh, areas of Sacramento County that, that were most pollution burdened were. And there's a lot of data, they have a really, really long report uh, about, about kind of what the data shows. And their top pick was South Sacramento Florin, uh, which is designated as the formal community. Their B community is North Sacramento and their C community is, is uh, where we're working in, in Oak Park Fruit Ridge. Um, so there's a lot of, a lot to say, I think about, about that. Um, uh, but then there's, you know, there's just a ton of data that's been generated about, about why these communities um, were selected. And, and Meadowview is, is, the, is the C community right now, uh, by the way, um, uh, as nominated by the Air District. Mark? Sorry, I was just getting to the, the unmute button. <laughs> um, you know, just again, you know, very high level, um, you know, much like what Adrian just shared. I think the important thing to recognize is there are many areas in Sacramento that are very deserving of increased attention, look because of economics, because of long-term history and impacts that have put them at a disadvantage. Um, you know, part of the challenge just statewide is, you know, it's a statewide program and unfortunately the resources are only go to so many communities. That said, though, I think that one of the most important things that can come out of this, and a couple of the other people have already either asked questions or made questions and statements touched upon this, is one of the main goals behind 617 is to take the lessons learned from all of this, 
whether it be the community grant that Valley Vision and the partners have that they're talking about here tonight, and we're simply um, helping provide um, advice to them on from a technical standpoint. But really, it's the lessons learned, not just from the communities we have under the community grant, under the formal community here in Sacramento, but all the communities throughout California is to learn so we can apply the lessons learned everywhere. Um, you know, there are gonna be, you know, if we're finding that roadway emissions, for example, are a big issue, you know, you're not gonna also just change a vehicle in one spot. You're gonna be looking to try and do with as much with vehicles as possible everywhere and creating that benefit, not just in the areas where you're currently monitoring and looking. Um, you know, it was mentioned earlier about concerns still on the leaded fuel for the, the smaller aircraft. You know, should there be changes nationally, because actually, unfortunately, leaded fuel is actually more of a national issue, even though we can look at it local as well. But to the extent that that change happens, that's not going to happen just at one airport. That would be a broader trend that's going to benefit everyone everywhere that's impacted by those type of emissions. So I think that's just one thing that I just want to throw out there is that there is, you know, those good things. Just very high level in terms of where it is, as I said at the very beginning, you know, we think there are so many areas deserving and needing this added attention, um, at least for the no areas that we have nominated, um, which includes Meadowview, because I know that's an area that's come up on multiple occasions. That is one of our top areas that we've been nominating in the last couple of years to the state. Uh, but basically, it was looking at just a number of factors, everything from cancer rates, life expectancy, um, vehicle drive driven, population densities, to name just a, a handful of factors. So just, you know, quick, I don't want to take away from the presentation that's been going on today, but just in order to very high level touch upon some of those questions. Thanks. And I'm sharing my screen now showing the just the geographies that were nominated for D617 um, this year or last year. Uh, if, if I make uh, make a correction about the AB617 information, is that okay? Sure. So it, I'm going to have to push back on AB617. The legislation specifically says that you don't have to set boundaries. The legislation specifically says that we have to focus on non-mobile polluting sources. And we did the opposite here in Sacramento. We set boundaries where we could have included Meadowview in the first place, and we focused on traffic rather than non-mobile uh, sources like the executive airport, the power plants, and all the other industrial commercial issues in, in the area. So I, I think it's misleading to say that the state would allow uh, more than one AB 617 opportunity when they're competing with 59 counties that we miss an opportunity from the first AB 617. We should have gone by what the legislation stated instead of uh, making our own terms locally that really kept us out of areas that we really needed to encompass. Thank you. Adrian, may I real quick? And I don't want to get into a back and forth, but what we were actually all required to do, air districts and community groups like for this community grant are actually to follow the CARB blueprint. And the blueprint did actually provide that specificity. So, you know, I don't wanna get into a, a back and forth per se, but um, we actually had to follow the guidelines set forward by the State California Resources Board in terms of the submittals. We consulted with CARB about that. We had the flexibility and you guys chose the opposite. Thank you for for that. Um, so so just to, to uh, you know set the table a little bit. Um, really appreciate folks for participating in today's conversation. We know it's it's challenging to do this work. Uh, don't want to pit communities against one another. We want to make sure that we're working together, uh, and that you know with all this air monitoring happening and about to happen, that we're that we're fully leveraging everything. Um, really appreciate you know the folks who have supported us over the last. Uh, you know, two years really uh, of work and of organizing and really encourage folks to check out the, the data set that we've, that we've made available on the webpage. It's all publicly available. Anyone can go analyze it, take a look if you'd like, uh, including the, the air monitoring portal and then those action plans that, that community members uh, began to draft. So SNAC 2.0, we really, we really hope 
uh, will result in a, a, a real action plan that can be taken seriously by CARB when it comes to AB 617. That includes investment, that includes enforcement, that includes everything that the community wants. Um, and so, you know, all that being said, uh, and maybe someone can put the, the um, survey link in the chat one more time, really do encourage you to, to work with us on figuring out this participatory budgeting process. Um, I think it's going to be, you know, it's going to be interesting, uh, as I think all participatory budgeting can be, um, but really excited for, you know, how it can sort of, you know, how it can, how it can make for a really compelling and creative project uh, as we, as we seek, you know, to prioritize what, what we want to do in our communities. So Mark, do you still have your hand up? Or can I go to Brandon? It is not supposed to still be up. <laughs> all right, Brandon. Uh, yeah, I'll just do a couple of things. One, um, when I looked at the data uh, that was posted, it, it does show the median of all the air quality and all the monitors showed it was within the healthy range. So we can hear it's a very negative, it's very negative tone tonight about how unhealthy it is, but yet that data didn't show that. And so maybe there's more in the data that can pinpoint specific sources or something. But I just wanted to point that out for people who are not familiar with the air, qual air quality data on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and the other thing, Smud, I, I just answer Fatima's uh, question here is Smud is intending to close two of our power, two of our natural gas fired power plants, uh, the Campbells and, uh, and, and McClellan. Uh, we're busy working to um, build some large new solar projects that, would, that will allow us to do that in, in the next uh, two to three years. But that project and those intentions are still uh, on track. So just FYI. Thanks for that. Appreciate the update. All right, folks. Anything else for the good of the order? Okay. Just, just want to close with um, gratitudes for the group to elevating their concerns and really being outspoken and passionate about what they want to see uh, in, in this process and, and in other processes. Um, I'm going to do my due diligence to make sure that these concerns are elevated to all of our project partners who aren't here on the call and that we keep them top of mind as we move forward with our next steps. Um, invite any of you to reach out to me directly with any other insight, expertise, uh, concerns that you may have. I'll go ahead and drop my cell phone along with my email in the chat um, for those of you that might want to reach out. And for those of you that might want to stay involved, um, you can reach out to Christina directly. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your comments and your feedback. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Okay, everybody. Well, with five minutes to, minutes to spare, we'll let you all get back to your, your families and friends and loved ones. Uh, really appreciate the time and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Bye, everybody. Peace, everybody. Be safe. You as well. Thank you.